Hi, my name is Tony Montefusco. I'm here today to try to put a program together on the Atmos clock. This clock is a very delicate clock to work on. It takes a little skill and the ability of a watchmaker to perform some of the duties of this fine piece. What we're going to attempt today, and I hope we're successful, is we will disassemble it, replace the suspension spring, reassemble it, and adjust it. Now this is a catalog that's available through the LaCoultre company. And if you have a patent pencil handy, at the end of the program, I'll give you an address where it can be purchased. It's very inexpensive. It sells for somewhere around three or four dollars. And it's a very worthwhile tool to have in your library. We'll go through some of the pages and I'll show you what the catalog consists of. Now we'll get to the Atmos clock. Okay, before we get to the movement, there's some of the tools that you're going to need to service this clock. These are the tools that are in the catalog that are available to the suppliers that service NAWCC or most of the material houses around the country. They're readily available and they can be purchased. <clears throat> the ones I find very essential in service in the clock is the hand remover, the movement holder, the balance nut wrench, the balance support, and the threading needle, or the threading tube they call it, for threading the suspension up through the upper portion of the clock. And most of all, the balance poising tool. Now some of these other wrenches, I think you can make them yourself or use other devices and most of the times I don't even find them very essential in servicing this clock. What I have done, I had built all of mine. Now these are the tools that I made myself quite a few years ago in servicing these clocks. This is my hand remover, my movement stand, my balance nut wrench, my pendulum stand, my poising tool, and a threading tube for my suspension spring. These are all made without too much trouble. A lot of them, some I made out of wood, some I made out of metal. But they all work very, very well. And I think you can do the same if you just, you know, give it a little try. Now we'll get to the clock. This is the clock we're going to work on today. This is a model 528. And it's an excellent, excellent piece. I'll get back a little further so I can get a better shot out of here. I'll get some of my tools out of your way. This is a very fine piece. It's a clock that requires a little bit of skill to service. It's a very delicate piece and very fragile in many, many aspects. And with any rough treatment, I think you're looking for an expensive repair. So in handling this clock, if it's the first time you're going to do it, handle them with care and be very, very careful on what you're doing. So we'll get started with this. The first thing we have to do is take and lock the pendulum. There's a lock at the bottom 
Some of them have a lock up in here, but this one happens to have a lock at the bottom. So I'll pull a lock over and we'll lock that pendulum into place so that if we move the clock, we're not going to hurt nothing. It, it stays pretty stationary. I've taken the liberty of taking some of the screws out the top. I got one more left here. I'll take that out. Now first let me explain some of the cases. There are several different type cases on the Atmos clock. This one happens to have a, a spring loaded bar at the bottom. You push the glass down, glass comes out. Others have a door on them. And still here's another that has two steady pins. Oops, sorry. Two steady pins on the side of the case. You pull the pins out and you lift the whole top of the of the cabinet off. And in doing so, be very careful. Lift the, lift the part up, bring it forward, and then lift it up slowly. Be careful not to catch the bottom of the frame on the minute hand post, because you're going to break it off. And you don't want to do that. Now, I'll, take the, I'll take the glass out, the front glass out, push it down, and pull it out, set it aside. Be careful with these glasses, they have a slight, a slight bevel on them, and you don't want to have to replace them. I'll take this last screw out here, take the top off carefully, take out the side panel, take the other panel out, take the back panel out. Now what we want to do is take the hand off. See if I get a little bit of an angle here for you so you can see what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the hand remover and I'm going to take that hand off. Take the hand remover, slide it over the top of the hand. Let it come down. Try to keep my hands out of your way if I can. Let it over the center post. And then turn it. And it'll come off the shaft. Hopefully. And the hand will come off like that. Be very careful, this is a balanced hand. Don't want to distort it in any way. Put it in your tray. The hour hand is only friction tight like any other clock hand, just pulls on and off like so. Now what I like to do is I'll set it on its back. I'll use my, my pendulum stand. I'll set it on its back and we'll proceed to take the dial off. The dial has two small screws on it. One on this side, one on this side. Now selecting a screwdriver to take some of these, all these screws out, these screws are nice, highly polished, and you don't want to mar them up, so make sure you select the right size screwdriver so you don't scratch them up in any way. We'll take, we'll take this one out. I'll loosen that one off. I'll loosen this one. And I'll lift the dial with the screws so I don't lose them. take the screws out. I'll put them in my tray so I don't, they're very tiny. I don't want to lose them. I'll set that aside. I'll take out the paper filler. And then on a dial plate there are four screws and they're on pillar posts. So it's a good idea to take and mark the top, put a little scribe mark up at the top 
signifying what end it goes on. So you put it on, you put it on in the right manner. Loosen all these screws off. Even the screws underneath the dial are nice and polished. Very, very elegant piece. I think Atmos did a, a super job on building this clock. Move the screws, put them in our tray so we don't lose them. And very carefully loosen it, loosen it from its studs, and then lift it off carefully. Set it aside with your others moving. Now while we still have it on its back, I'm going to take off the aneroid tank. It makes it a lot easier handling in this way. There are two nuts that hold it. See if you can get a good angle on that. There we go. There are two nuts that hold it on. There's one over here on the bottom. Then there's also one on the opposite side on the top. Now they sell a special wrench for this, but I use a, a, a commercial type open end 9 sixteenths, or 5 sixteenths, I'm sorry. And it does the job very, very well for me. You take it, loosen up the knot. Work it carefully, don't try to scratch it up in any way if you can. And take your screwdriver and you can spin it off now. We can take and we can take that, that nut out. As you see the nuts, even the nuts on the tank are nice and highly polished. Now on the other side, just spin this clock around, and there's another one right here. So we'll take that one off. Give it a couple of turns. Take our screwdriver and we can spin it off. Now hold the aneroid tank up against the frame like so and then just pick it back up put it back up on its on its flat side kind of hold it in place a little cumbersome but it worked out very well the back here so you can see and then just take the tank and just pull it back straight back and it'll it'll come off There's our tank and there's our winding spring. I'll put that aside. We'll get back to that in a little while. Now we'll turn it around and we'll take the movement out. Now there's two screws that hold the movement in. There's one on this side and one on this side. With a little larger screwdriver so you don't scratch up the channels in the heads. Just unscrew them off. Now the movement's not going to fall out. It's on two studs. And it'll, it'll stay in there without the screws momentarily. I'll take this one out. Well, what you must do here is that there's power in this mainspring and there's no 
ordinary click like you know on a on a regular clock where you can release the click and the power will come down. What you have to do here, you have to hold the mainspring and the second wheel. And then with your with your screwdriver, what I do is I, I hold it from the front. I hold it with one finger there and one finger here. And I'll take and I'll loosen I'll loosen this movement off. Holding holding the mainspring and the second wheel. Come off nice and slowly. Hold the second wheel and lift the movement out carefully. Don't bend the fork when you take it out. Now I can let the mainspring down, let it run down a little bit. So all the power is released from the mainspring. And we'll take our movement holder, put this aside a little bit. What we do with the movement holder is we set our movement on the stand. This way here, it protects that fork from being damaged in any way. And it's also a good movement holder for when you're assembling and disassembling the movement. I'll set that aside and we'll get back to that. Now all we have left is the pendulum. And you say, now how are we going to get that out of there? Well, it's not necessarily that difficult. Get a good shot here. Now on the top of the movement, there's a little set screw back here that puts the tension on that tapered pin that's holding the suspension wire. Give it about one and a half turns just to loosen the tension off on the spring. And that'll, that'll release that. Now back in here, there's, a, there's another screw that holds the regulator. See if I can get it from the other end. I think I think I can get it better from the other side and not block your view out. Up in here, there's a there's a set screw. Find it here. It is. Get my hand out of the way. There's a set screw up in there. Give that. Give that also a couple of turns. Don't take it out. Just back it off. Back it off about one or two turns. And that'll release the regulator when we're ready to take the pendulum out. Now what we must do is the pendulum is still in the locked position. I'll take out the tapered pin. Just pull it out slowly. It's got a slight taper to it. We'll put that in our bucket. And I'll slide this over to the edge of the table. I'll let it hang over a little bit, like so. And I'll get to those two mounting nuts there that holding the clock frame in. I'll go underneath here and I'll take I'll take one out here. There's two. There's one on this side and one on the other side. I'll turn it around and we'll get the other two. It's, it's pretty well balanced. If you don't get it out too far, you shouldn't have any trouble losing it. And we'll take the other one out. Now that you notice, you notice even the screws underneath are highly polished. That's the quality of the clock. Now we'll set it up 
back on the table carefully. Get your view here. Now I'll take and we'll unlock the pendulum. I'll unlock this pendulum and I'll let the pendulum come down through the locking plate. It'll come down there through the locking plate and it's resting down on it. Now I can take the frame and I can lift the frame right on out up through the locking plate. Nice and careful. And we'll just set that aside for now. And now we have the pendulum out of the case. Now there's one thing I want to cover here before we get into the suspension spring. This roller that's on this, this, this roller has to be very free. It, it runs, it runs very, very free. There's no tension on it. It's not like a roller jewel in a watch where it's rigid. This one has to be very free and it has to roll. So when we clean this, make sure that we clean it thoroughly. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that when we get into the cleaning part. Now you can say, how am I going to get this spring out of here? I look under here, there's, there's, a, there's a cylinder thing here. Well, that's where, your, that's where your balance nut comes in, balance wrench. It has two cutouts in the cylinder of the nut. And the tool that I made up is just a round cylinder with a pin in the center. So I can put it inside that, that channel and I can turn this off. And then I can turn the screw off. Take the screw off, take the balance off. And now we have the balance pipe. Now underneath here, there's just another screw with the channel in it. Unscrew it. Loosen it up. Unscrew it out carefully. Don't be too much in a hurry when you're working on this clock. And just slide the suspension out. And a regulator came with it. Now this, this spring has a lot of distortion to it. It also has a, about a 90 degree turn. So I guess that's why the clock wasn't really running that well. This suspension spring is only 2,000 thick, so we're gonna replace that with a new one. And the new one comes like this. It comes in a capsule. And it has, it's mounted on a, on a mounting nut and the regulator is in it, we have to reinstall it. We'll get to that in a little while. Now underneath this balance wheel, there are rating nuts, or rating washers, I should say. Just like there, your balance washers on your balance wheel of a, of a watch, when it's running too fast, you add weight to it. When it's running too slow, you, you subtract weight. And you do the same thing with the balance on this clock. When you change the suspension spring, a lot of times you'll find that the rate is not the same as it was with the old spring. So you have to re-regulate it. And we'll go through that when we put the suspension spring in. I like to cover a little bit of this winding mechanism on this clock. You say, how does this clock wind? Nobody ever winds it. It stays on the shelf and it runs for, for time and time and nobody winds it up. Well, 
What's in this aneroid tank is a bellows. It looks something like this here. I have a reserve one. It's a bellow type can. And as this bellow contracts and expands, it winds this spring up. And what it does is it winds that mainspring up like that. And the protection that it has is that when this mainspring gets wound all the way, I'll wind it up like that. Now that, that is fully wound. Now the, the guard spring that's inside of here, and I'll show you that later, goes over the top of this and doesn't allow this tank to push it any further because it blocks it out. And that protects the mainspring from being broken or being overwound. I'll just let this down and you'll see how the, how the, spring will, the spring will, coil spring will walk right back out again. And that's how the clock winds up. With that, with that bellow going back and forth, it winds that clock up. It doesn't need much to wind it. Now we'll get to the aneroid tank. I'll get some of these things out of the way so we don't, we don't lose them in any way. Now this is just a decorative cover that's on. It just snaps on and it comes on off. Now, as I showed you in the reserve tank, this, this tank is full of ethyl chloride. And that's about, that's about as far as I can, can squeeze that tank. I can't collapse it all the way down. That, I can't go much further than that. And you can say, how am I going to get that tank out of there? There's a locking plate on here. It's got four fangs on it. Now, I try to turn it. I, there's no way I can turn it. It's so tight with the pressure that's in this tank. Now normally I would take this and I would put it in a refrigerator and that'll collapse that tank and then I can take the ring off. So I'll give you a little demonstration of what really happens. I'll take, I'll place a couple ice cubes in here. I watch what happens. In less than a minute, I couldn't squeeze that tank. You saw that. Now look at what happened with the ice cubes. It just collapsing that tank right down to nothing. Isn't that, isn't that in a phenomenal? Now, with the tank being down like that, I don't have any pressure up here. I can take that tank out of there. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll place these ice cubes in the tank. And I'll collapse that tank. Okay. I, don't, I don't do this normally. This is just a demonstration of how that tank works. I will put it in the refrigerator and let it collapse the aneroid tank. Now you can see the ice cubes going down, going down into the tank, and it's collapsing that tank that's in there. When it gets all the way down to the bottom, I can take that locking plate off. Looks like it's pretty well down now. See if I can I can take my fingers and I can pop that cover off. And before I couldn't even I couldn't even get nowhere near it. Take the guard spring out, take the ice cubes out, and I'll take the tank out. Now that tank will come back almost as quick as it went down. The minute you get the ice out of it, it starts to come back. Really something, isn't it? <laughs> now we know the tank is good. So I can I can put this I can put this back in inventory and I can reuse the tank that's that that's in this 
and the clock here. Just dry out a little bit of that water. And we put it back the same way. We put it back. Now that we know it's good, I'll take it off. I'll place the ice cubes back in it again. And that tank will go down inside the canister. And this is the guard spring that I was telling you about that protects the clock from being overwhelmed. This, this guard spring will just go down just so far. And once, when this spring here, is, when this clock is wound up all the way, like that, that guard spring will keep that aneroid tank from activating that spring any further until, this, until the mainspring winds, winds down and this coil spring comes all the way out to here and then the tank will take and push it and start winding it up again like that. There's only two degrees plus or minus that'll keep that clock wound up. Okay, now that the, the tank is all the way down, I'll keep those cubes in there. Now when you get to this point, you have to work a little, a little quick because if set your, set your piece on there, set it down inside the, inside the canister. Okay. And give it a quarter of a turn. Like that. Now we can take the cubes out and then I'll dry out the tank a little bit. But that's the way you have to replace the tank. Don't use the ice cubes, just put it in the refrigerator for about three or four minutes and that'll go down and you'll be able to take it out. But when you take it out of the refrigerator, you got to work quickly because the minute the warmth of your hands touches this canister, that bellow will start coming back again and you won't be able to get it off. So just once you get it out of the refrigerator, real quick, turn it off and get the spring out. Now I did that, I did that little demonstration for a purpose to show you how to replace the tank if you have one that's defective. Now if you have an idea that there's nothing wrong with the tank, there's another way to check it without taking it apart. You take a ruler, a ruler that has metric reading on it, millimeters, and measure from the inside of the tank, from the bottom of the tank here, from the bottom of the tank to the outer portion of the, of the, you can get a good shot of that. Like that. Now if that measures 22 millimeters, that tells me that that tank is good. If this ruler goes all the way down to the canister and it measures 41 millimeters, then I got a bad canister. I got a bad aneroid tank and I have to replace it. That's the way you can check it, just by by measuring it. But I showed you, I demonstrated the ice cubes to show you how it has to be replaced. And that's the only way you can replace it. I'll set that aside. Now we'll get to the movement. Now the first thing we want to do here, I'll turn it over. And we're going to take the pallet out because we don't want to hurt that, that fork in any way. Two screws holds the bridge on. Take the two screws out. Carefully. Put them in your tray. When you remove the bridge, just kind of, if I can get around this way, I think you can see better. 
hold the pallet and then just lift the bridge off so that the pallet doesn't fall on you and lift it up out of the jewel hole and slide it, slowly slide it out of the movement you want to get on this side you can see better take the take the fork and just slide it out like that now this is a very delicate fork and it's very very lightweight in fact, it doesn't weigh much more than a, a good fork and a good sized pocket watch. Actually, there are two pallets. Get a little closer here. You can see, you can see a, a recognizable pallet, very much like in a, in a pocket watch, with the pallet stones, and then this is the second. So there's actually two pallets here. And this pallet has to be perfectly balanced and in poise, just like a balance wheel in a watch. If it's not poised and balanced correctly, it's not going to keep good time for you. And I'll show you how we do that. I made up my own little poising tool. What it is, A pair of pivot straightening tweezers, the real wide ones that you have in your bench, and it works out very well as a poising tool. I take the balance, you see how light it is. Now you see that pallet is leaning, is leaning over to one side. Put a straight angle behind it. It's got quite a lean to it, which tells me that this tongue on this side is is in too far. So what I'll have to do there is I'll take this out. I'll pull this tongue out a little bit. And we'll try it again. Let it come to rest. And you, 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 you balance it by either pushing these tongs in or out, and that'll give you a good balance. And it's still out a little bit. Give it just a little bit more. Just move it back with my finger a little bit. Be very careful. Don't put too much muscle to it. You're going to lose it. I got just a little bit more. Just take a little time, but it's something that has to be done. Okay, now we're we're perfectly poised. Balance comes to rest, up and down. It's leaned a little bit on this side now, which tells me that I got a little too much weight there. I 
All right, now we got a poised balance. Or a poised palate, I'm sorry. Now when you bend these tongs back and forth, make sure that they're parallel with each other. Not that they're twisted in any way, because that'll throw your that'll throw your poise off also. Now we have a poise I can take and I can I can put it aside. And we won't hurt it. Put that away. And now we'll take we can take the movement apart. Everything in this clock has to be super clean in order to function properly. Any dirt, residue, oil is, is a no-no in this clock. Four screws holding the, holding the plate on. Take them off. Take this four screws out, put them on our tray, because these all go on a cleaning basket and we'll clean it up. Now on the side of the of the pillars, there's, there's a couple of cutouts. You put your screwdriver in there and you can lift them up nice and careful. Try not to bring it up too fast. You don't want to hurt the pivots. And just carefully lift, lift, lift the plate off. Kind of where you want to come with it. And the minute wheel stays on there. Now we have intermediate wheel. This is our center wheel and our escape wheel. And that's the plate. Now this center wheel, this is the one that I have to caution you. This is the one that has that very thin long pivot on the top. And that's the one that gets broken off very easily. So you, you want to be very careful of that so you don't hurt it in any way because God forbid you should break this that pivot off. You're looking at about a 90 or 95 dollar replacement wheel. So be very careful in handling any of the parts, especially the center wheel. Now I'll put these all in the basket and we'll get them all cleaned up. Then we'll come back and put it back together again. Now we'll take a little intermission and we'll get to part two shortly. Don't go away. Okay, now that the movement's all clean, we're back. I'll place the intermediate wheel down in the jewel hole. Make sure that these jewels glisten. They have to really be clean. I have to, I have to emphasize that very strongly. If you see any residue inside the hole, take your peg wood, peg it out, and get them super clean. Put in the escape wheel. And now I can put my bridge on, my plate on. Keep calling it a bridge. Slide it over that middle wheel post, the center wheel post, and slide it down onto the movement. Be careful not to hurt anything or bend it in any way. Now I'll put, I'll put the pivots in a hole. I'll just 
Make sure that all your pivots are in a hull before you press down on your plate. I'll put in a couple of screws. Kind of stabilize things. Get one on this side just to hold everything together. And I can make another check here. Check and see that my train is free. There's nothing binding. Everything is running nice and free. Everything's in the hall. And I can go ahead and put my rest of my screws in. Tighten these screws down. I'll snug them down first. I won't put any torque to them. I just double make sure that everything is in place. Okay, everything is running nice and freely. I know all the pivots in the right place. Now I can go ahead and lock, lock the screws down. You don't have to put much torque on these screws. Just snug them down nice and tight. Don't put too much muscle to them, otherwise you'll snap the tops right off. And that's our movement all back together. Nice and clean. Now I'll put the, we'll put the pallet in that we have poised. Flip it down inside, put it in the jewel hall. And we can put our plate on. plate on, put your pallet in the position, got my hands in your way a little bit, and I'll put a screw in there to stabilize it a little bit. Snug it down. See that my my fork is free. Okay, the pallet is free. I can put in the other screw. You don't want to tighten anything down tight until you're absolutely sure that the pivots are in the hole because they're very, very fine and you can snap them off very easily. Torque them down a little bit. Now with a little power on there, I've got a, I've got a free running fork. So that tells me that everything is running nice and free. Now we'll put that aside. Settle your oil on this clock. You do not oil the train wheel pivots at all. No oil at all. You do not oil the pallet fork. You do not oil the pallet pivots. And most of all, you do not oil the pallet jewels. Now that might seem strange for a watchmaker to say that, but that's the way this clock operates. No oil in this movement at all. The only place you do oil is the barrel arbor, the second wheel on both sides, and sparingly a little bit of oil on this ratchet wheel and ratchet and ratchet axle down in here. Very, very lightly. You don't use an awful lot of oil like you do in an ordinary clock. All the oil in this clock is used sparingly, very sparingly. And now we'll set this aside. We'll take a little in. For now, 
had that all complete, it installed a suspension spring. I have my roller all cleaned. I'll put it onto the onto the pipe. Sits down in there. Set it down snug. And then take the spring and put a little bit of down pressure onto it. Very little, not much. And then lock the screw tight. So that there's a little bit of down pressure there and, and a little freedom here. Now, as you'll see, this 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 roller is nice and free now. It just it just rolls at will. And it should be. No oil, no nothing in there. Now I take the suspension spring. Get back a little bit so you can see me better here. And I'll I'll put it into the pipe. Hopefully it'll go down through the bottom without too much trouble. I'll get my hands out of your way so you can see. I'll rotate the pipe as it goes down. And we come right on through. Now a good practice to do here is don't turn the screw at the top because that spring is hanging unprotected. Just hold the screw tight and just turn the pipe. And screw the pipe up into the into the screw. So you don't hurt that spring in any way. It's very delicate. Like I told you, it's only two thousandths of an inch thick, so we'll do it nice and careful here. Takes a little time to do this, so don't be in a hurry because you're gonna break it. It is very, very fragile. Okay. Have it down tight. Now with my screwdriver, I'll take and I'll I'll lock it tight. Now we're ready for our pendulum. Now remember I, I told you about the regulating weight on the bottom? I'll just set this down a second. The regulating weight on the bottom, like I showed you, look like this. And they come in different, different thicknesses. And the thickness will determine how fast or how slow a day it will run. If it measures, if it measures one and a half millimeters in thickness, like so, that's 15 minutes a day. If it measures two millimeters in thickness, that's 20 minutes a day. Now when you do this, you have to put one on each side. You put one over here and one over here to balance it off. And that'll give you 20 minutes a day, plus or minus. If you add it on, it's plus. If you take them off, it's minus. And that's the only way you can really regulate this clock because there's no timing machines or anything. You have to let it run for 24 hours and then regulate it with that. Okay, I'll take and put this on onto my stem. And I'll put the screw on loosely. Because there's something here I do that I, 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 like, I like to pass on if I can. I'll put it this way so you can see it better. When I had the suspension spring in, and it's laying flat this way, what I like to do, I put, I put my roller in line with my cross barrel, cross arms on the balance. So this, this almost puts me in beat with the, with the clock. I won't add too much setting up of the beat. So I'll take and I'll lock my suspension spring runs parallel with the plates in the clock. Your roller comes right straight out. I'll show you that when we get it in back in the clock. And then my cross arms are parallel with my suspension spring. 
just something that I do. It's not in the book. And it makes it a little easier to put the clock in B. Okay, what we have to do now is grab a hold of the suspension at the end with a pair of pliers. You're not going to hurt nothing at the end because that's the part that sticks out from the clock. And take our regulator and move it down into the pipe about halfway. So that we can see whether the, the piece is in poise or not. Pick it up, put the pliers, look and see that the regulator is right in the center of the roller hull. See if I can get a little closer here so you can see it a little bit better. That regulator has to be exactly in the center of that hull. Going out of focus again here. Losing my focus here. Okay. So if you find it's leaning, it's going to lean into me a little bit. It, it's right on this side here. So what I'll do is I'll take my my poisoning tool for the balance and I'll put it on the opposite side. Facing away from me. And I'll I'll give it a I'll give it a couple turns. I'll back it off. This takes a little bit of time. But it, it, it's a thing that has to be done. Because if the balance is not poised, your clock is not going to run well. Okay, I was lucky. I got it on the first shot. That's nice and centered now. Now I can take and I can put this back in the clock. And the only caution I can give you here is treat this wire with the care that you would a fine hairspring. It's even finer than the hair. It's only two thousandths thick. Straighten that up a little bit so I can get it into the pipe better. Yeah, that's pretty good. It is fine and you don't wanna you don't wanna bend it too much. Now with my movement, this is that tool I told you that I made up that it's also available that you can buy. And I, I set it down inside the, the hole where the suspension comes up through. And what that does, it's, it, straightens, it straightens out that hole that is larger at the bottom and then somewhere in the middle it kind of comes inward and then up into a smaller hole, so it, it makes it hard to lace that suspension through there. I will try to lace this up through here. I hope I can give you a good view. This does take a little bit of time, so I'll to get a little closer here. Put my third eye on. And I'll see if I can place that up and through the top. Come on up through the hull. My threader's coming out. Get through the locking plate in the bottom. And the regulator will go up in the hull. Now I'll put my pendulum stand underneath. We'll stand it up 
Take the bushing out. There's our wire. I'll take I'll take the slot out of this suspension wire and I'll just drop that pin in there. Put a little bit of down pressure on. Now I've got it suspended. Take it off the stand. And this is an important part that has to be done. The clearance, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Now after you have your wire in and you got your slack taken out, this bottom part of the pendulum is laying up against the locking plate. The distance between this disc and this disc has to be equal. And the way we do that is, while the pin is still loose enough in the holder, take a, your hammer with a, a small punch and just tap it lightly. And you'll watch that disc come on down until, until it's free. Yeah, a little bit more. That looks pretty good. But that pendulum has to be very free and very swing. So when it swings freely so it doesn't touch anything, and you get the distance from this disc to this disc is the same in between the locking plate, then you have it in the right position. Okay? Okay, what I have to do now is I have to lock this locking screw here. Get a hold of it here. And lock that taper pin in. Lock that tight. And then also lock the regulator. Lock the regulator screw and lock the tapered pin screw. Bring this around slowly. We've got nothing protecting it now, it's just hanging freely. Okay, now when this pendulum lays at rest, see if I can stop it here. where it's, it's at zero position. This roller has to be looking right straight at you, like so. Pointing out straight when it's at zero dead center. You just loosen up your screw and put it on center. That puts the clock in beat. Okay? That's why I put the crossbar parallel with the suspension spring, so it gives me it gives me almost a presetting for to put my to put it in B. She still has a little tension on it yet, She's coming around. Should go back the other way. So she's setting, she'll be, she'll be setting at rest. That'll be, that'll be zero position right there. So now we know that the clock is almost in beat. Now I can put it on the stand, set this aside a bit. Bring my stand here. And I'll put it on 
just like when I took it off. I'll put it at the edge of the table. Pick it up carefully. Nice. And line it up with your screws. I'll put one screw on this side. Just bring it out to the edge of your bench a little bit. Put one screw in one hole. Find them. Turn it around and get the other two. I'm going to screw it here. Out of the way. There's two on this side. Snug. Now we got our, our locking device working for us. Set it back on the on the bench. And we'll put our movement in. A little test that you can do after you've installed your suspension spring to make sure that you have the clearance down through the pipe and into the blocking plate. Take your pendulum disc, give it 360 degree turn, and just let it run without the, the movement in or without the aneroid tank on. Just the plain frame of the movement. Now, if everything is correct, that the suspension spring is, is clean inside, it's not kinked, it's not bent, and it's in the locking plate position correctly, the pendulum should run approximately anywhere between 30 and 40 minutes before it comes to a, a complete stop. That'll tell you that the suspension, the alignment of the suspension is correct. So that's a good test that you can make after you've installed the suspension spring. Spring, make sure that everything is correct here. This spring here after, after you put it on, there's a little chain that comes through here. And it has, it has an adjustable link space. Normally, these will take about six or seven links before you can pin it. But a good test on that is this, this spring should measure 47 millimeters after, after you have the plate on. You got 47 millimeters here. This, the tension on this is correct. And you can, you can adjust that with the chain that's on the back here, like so. Pull it out, take the pin out, and move it in. That way you know you have the proper tension on this spring as opposed to the guard spring. So that's another good test you can make before you put the aneroid tank on. Okay, now that we have our movement all clean and everything is poised, we can set the movement into the clock. Be careful when you're putting this in that you don't bend this the fork. Bring it in nice and slowly. Put it onto your roller. I roll her around. Put it into the roller onto your studs and then push it in like that.
take your two screws nice that that movement stays on those studs so you can you can kind of work things a little bit without having have to have ten hands you see how nice and polished everything is it's really a finely made cloth I like working on these because when you're finished with them you know you have accomplished something. All right, now I'll put a little power to it. We'll put the aneroid tank on. Side. Tools are waste so we don't hurt them. Put the tank on. Put the tank on the same way I took it off. I'm going to lay it on its back. I'll put it on, on my stand. I'll set it, I'll set it in, in the clock. And then I'll lay it on its back and I can put, I can put the nuts on. That way I don't have to have I don't have to have 10 hands. Put one nut on here. Take and snug it up. Bring this one around in here. Put the other nut on. Tighten them down too tight. Just bring them down nice and snug. Remember when we took the dial plate off, we put a little mark at the top, put it back the same way. It snaps on a couple of posts here. Put in our screws. One there. Put in our last screw. Stuck it down. Put our paper filler in. Set our dial on. Take our two dial screws, one in there. One on the other side. Take and tighten them down. Put our hands on. The hour hand on first. Set it down. Set it at 12 o'clock. And we'll put our minute hand on. Now putting your minute hand on is just as important to taking careful attention as you did when you took it off. Place it on nice and, nice and careful. 
and with a little bit of pressure, push it down to where it's all the way home. And I kind of hold it at one end so it doesn't wiggle on me. And that, that'll give me, give me a reading. Okay? Set this, set this back up on end. I can put my, I can put my glasses in. My wife already cleaned these for me while I had them off. I'll set in, I'll set in the back glass. channel by glass here kind of hold it together till you get the top on screw in there to kind of hold things steady and then I can finish the others later. One screw on the top. And we can put our glass in. Goes in this this is on this is spring loaded. Push it down into the hole and then up. There's another little piece here. I don't have it right now. I have to, a little handle to push it down and take the glass out. Okay. I'll unlock that pendulum. Now, if you've done a good job cleaning, you've got a super clean movement and your suspension is in the right position where it's running free and clear, a good test to make when you're all finished is the number of oscillations that your pendulum makes. You should run somewhere around 500 to 540 degrees. And a good way to check that, these moffets that are in the pendulum disc, there are 12 on the disc. If you can count 17 to 19 in one revolution in one direction, then you've done a good job. You've got an oscillation of 540 degrees. You count them as they go by. We'll wait till this one settles down and we'll count them off. All right, this is my first point here. I'll count them away from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Now I've got, I've got an excellent oscillation of 20 Moffats. That's 600 degrees. So it tells you that I did an excellent job on cleaning the movement suspension in the right position and everything working the way it's supposed to have. So that's what you can look for. Okay. Okay, here's a sample of the 540. And 540 is very much like the, the other two Atmos clocks. But there are some exceptions. The, the, the frame is different. The layout is almost the same. But when you have to take the bellows off,
The bellows have two keyhole slots in them. One here, one there, one there. And as it goes on the back, it goes on the back, like so. And then it, it turn it and it locks in, and turn it and locks, comes out. It doesn't, it doesn't have the four, the two or the four screws like the, the other two Amos clocks. Now in order to take the unit out, there's a screw at the top and there's a screw at the bottom. Remove the two screws and you can take the unit out. Okay, I've removed the two screws. Now there's no studs that hold this movement in. You have to hold it as you take the screws off. And then just carefully lift it off the frame like so. Be careful of the fork, you don't bend it. Now you don't have to worry about the power in the mainspring because it's still in the movement. And I'll show you how to do that. Like on the 526 and the 528, you had to hold, you had to hold the wheels so that to let the power down when you took the unit out. On the 540, you don't have to do that. You can take the unit out, leave the power in the, in the clock. Okay, once you got the unit out and the power is in the, in the train, there's a, there's a ratchet click down here at the winding wheel. Put a little pressure on the wheel, pull it out, pull the clicks away, and let the power come down until there's no more power left in it. Then you can take the unit apart. That's one of the difference between the 540 and 528 and 526. Now I'll take the unit apart for you and show you the layout of that. Okay, here's the unit disassembled. Now one thing you have to observe when you take these units apart, look at the jewels. Make sure that they're sparkling clean. Now in this case, somebody had to try to either oil this clock or try to clean it whole. You cannot clean them whole. You have to take them apart in order to do a respectable job and a guaranteed job. The jewel holes were full of residue from either solution or old oil that somebody did not take off from the beginning. So I, had to, I had to scrub the unit very well, clean out the jewels. I had to peg them out with, 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 the, with the pegging, with the, with the peg stick and make sure that they're, they had to glisten. They had to look like a real jewel. In other words, a shiny diamond. If they're not shiny, they're not clean. And if they're not clean, the clock is not going to run. Okay? And that's the only difference between the 540 and the 528. The plates, are, the, the shapes of the plates are different. The pallet fork is different, vertical instead of with the 45 bend in it. And now I have it clean, I'll take it and I'll put it back together and we'll proceed with this program. <clears throat> okay, here's our unit all back together again. 540. Looks like it's got pretty good motion. I let it run before. 24 hours before I start putting the case back on it, make sure everything's okay. But I have to emphasize strongly, if you do not take that movement apart and clean it thoroughly, where the jewels glisten and shine like diamonds, this clock is not going to run. Okay? Good luck. Okay, here's the booklet I promised to show you at the beginning of the program. This is put out by the La Culture Company. 
It's distributed through most of the material houses throughout the country. But I'll give you an address at the end of the program where you can purchase it. It covers the 528, 526. It also includes the 540, which we showed you in the video. I'll go through some of these pages so you get to understand what you're looking at. This is the aneroid tank. I showed you how to check a good one from a bad one. 41 millimeters is a bad tank. And 22 millimeters gives you a good tank. You can just measure it with a metric ruler. It'll give you the whether it's good or bad. But I showed you how to test it with the ice cube so you can you can install it. I also showed you how to how to poise the pallet. I had the pallet in poise. This is a total description of the movement. Giving you a nomenclature of all the parts. And this is the mainspring. I didn't cover the mainspring in, in, a, in the clock because in my 35 plus years since I've been working on clocks, I've only replaced two Atmos mainsprings. Not because they were broken, but because they were rusty. But once you have the movement out, and you're working on that, and you want to check and see if the mainspring is okay, you don't have to take any more of the clock apart. What you got to do is take off the front plate. You don't have to take the suspension spring out. That's a good part of this clock. Once you have the movement out, you take the front plate off where the movement is mounted on. There's six screws that hold it in place. And once you've undone the chain, remember I showed you in the video how the, how the chain holds the ratchet wheel? Pull the, pull the pin out, let the chain come through the frame, the, the plate and the coil spring will come off, and then you, it'll detach the mainspring. So just take the six screws out, take the plate off, take the mainspring barrel out, and the suspension spring will stay right intact with the back frame. So you don't have to take the suspension spring out to check the mainspring. The suspension spring can stay with the back plate alone and the front plate taken off, just unhook this chain and take the barrel out. Make whatever repairs you have to make if you have to replace it or if you want to lubricate it and clean it. Do your repairs, put the barrel back in again, put the plate on and reattach re the chain. Now remember I told you the, 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 the length up here was 47 millimeters. When you tighten up your chain, just put it back in the same length that you took it out of. Okay? And I showed you how to get the regulator up into the frame. And the set screw that holds it up in there. You tighten up the set screw once you get the regulator up in there. And this is the part where it narrows down to when you put the suspension spring up through it. It gets bogged up in here because of the narrow cut. And in order to get through there, it's hard. So when you put the, the lacing needle through there, you can go up through the needle and you bypass all of that offset cut. And this is and this is the suspension. This is the suspension spring I showed you. It's the, the roller and the fork up at the top. Right in here, comes on down. The suspension spring comes down through the bottom. We're hooked in here like we took it apart. And these are the two discs that I told you. You have to have equal distance between these two discs in the locking plate. 
that it, it doesn't rub against either one of them. The distance between the two discs should be equal. That it could it could it could be free to run. This is the roller. I showed you how to put the the regulator into the roller so that it's centered. And then how to poise it. Make sure that the the regulator is in the center. Whichever way it's rubbing on, it hangs up here on the pair of pliers like I showed you. Put a pair of pliers into a vise to hold it if you want. Put the wire into the pliers and, and clamp it tight so it hangs nice and free. Then you can see which way that pipe is leaning. If it's leaning this way, you have to go the opposite way. If it's leaning that way, you have to pull the pipe back. So whichever way you're going, your, your poisoning tool will do that for you. And if you want to regulate, if you can't get enough regulation out of the regulator that's at the top, you can get you can get an additional ten minutes minus plus or minus. And by doing that, they have a tool in the toolkit that I'll show you that in a second here. That you can put that toolkit and in, into the into the slots of this wheel that's underneath the plate. And as you do that, you hold this wheel, then you can move this back to slow, and then that'll give you an additional fast regulation. And you can do that for about maybe three times and pick up anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes a day, plus or minus. If it's going too, if it's going too fast and you want to slow it down, You hold, hold this on this side, bring the regulator over to slow, over to fast, I mean, sorry, and then back to slow. And then it'll, this will turn as you come back with that. So that's another regulation you can make with the addition of the weights in the bottom of the pendulum. And this is the roller and a fork. And this is what it should look like. Oop, get a little bit out of focus here. This is what it should look like when you're looking at it from a side view. The roller fork should be quite close to the top of the roller. Not not to the very end of it, just the space that's in here. And then this the space that's up in here. So that when the roller comes around, this fork is going to ride a little bit higher as it makes its impulse. So you have enough clearance so it doesn't touch the top of the frame. If it hits the top of the frame, it's going to slow down and eventually it's going to stop the clock. But this is what your, 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 your pallet fork and your roller should look like when you're all finished. Exactly. If you make any deviations, you're going to have problems. And then looking at it from a top view, this is what your fork should look like in between your roller. The distance here and here in between is very, very little. Uh, 0 0.30 millimeters, which is just enough clearance to go through that fork, get its impulse, and then continue on. So those are, those are the nice things that you can, you can see inside the book that shows you that's the nice part I have in a catalog where you can you can look into it. Now here's the 526 and the 528. The 526 is a smaller frame clock. The movement is the same, only the case is a lot smaller. It also has a hinged door on it. You take and open up the door and then the pendulum stop lever it's in between the, the pendulum disc and the dial. It's inside the clock. It's a levered area to push it to the side and it locks the plate. On the 528, the 
the pendulum stop is at the bottom. But the case is much larger, so as you get acquainted with these clocks, your first visual sight of either clock, you can, you can identify whether it's a 526 or a 528 just by its size. But the movements, the movements are identical. And here's a, here's a, a view of the, of the all the parts knocked down. So that when you had the clock down, you can describe which part goes where. Your, your spring for your, for your chain. Here's your chain in here. All your wheels. And then at the bottom, it has. The numbers, the number of the part, and the descriptions, so that when you're ordering parts, you get the exact same part that you're looking for. So without without the book, you you really have a guessing game going. Now this this is the this is the balance disc that I showed you. So you put the weights on to either speed it up or slow it down. You put one on one side and one on the other side to balance it off. This is the dial pan which holds the dial on. And then these are all the polished screws for the clock so that you get the right screw in the right position. And they're all numbered and all just with descriptions on them, where they go and what they all do. And these are all polished, nicely, highly polished screws. And this is your aneroid tank assembly. This is your decorative plate, your locking spring, your canister, or they call it a drum, your bellow, and your locking plate. Quite a nice catalog for the money, and you should have one in your library. Now this is the 540. This is the one I showed you in the video. This is the type of case that we had on the one I showed you, but they come in they come in a different couple of different styles now. They also come with a, a glass dome and a different pendulum disc on the bottom, where it looks almost like a balance wheel in the, in the watch. I'll show you that as we get through them. Quite a nice, handsome-looking piece. It's it's similar to a 400 day, but much larger and much more more accurate and much better clock. And this is the this is the description of all the parts of the 540. You can see the plates are different. The train layout is practically the same. The pallet fork is different. It's vertical, straight up and down, as is the 526 and 528. It's got a 45 bend in it. And again, the description and number of the parts underneath. You have to know what you're ordering when you're ordering parts because you don't want to get the wrong part and, and have to send it back and have the expenses of that. These are the two discs that come in the 540. Very similar to the 528 with the weights and all, the same. And then the one that's in the glass dome looks like a Looks like a, a large balance wheel for a pocket watch, but much, much, much larger. It has screwed in screws on the, on the side, and there's six of them. And it also has the timing washers. The washer goes onto the screw, and then the screw goes into the plate. As you pull one end, you pull one on one side and one on the opposite side. And they also come in different thicknesses. And this is, this is the frame layout. At a 540, which is a little different than the, than the 528, 526. Also with a, with a, with a description and number. And then the, the bellow attachment. Remember I showed you the, the, the bellow had keyhole slots in it. You put it on. You just snap it on, snap it off. The locking spring and the canister. Coil spring and a description for everything.
And here's the address, I promise you. Now this is, I'll get a little closer here, you can maybe see better. Marriage Antiques Incorporated, RD2, Douglasville, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19518. And their hours are 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. They have a toll free number in case you're ordering parts 1 800 345 4101. I'm sure that some of the material houses in your area that carry watch and clock parts have it, but I found merit to be quite efficient on getting parts out to you. Okay, this concludes our program on service in the Atmos clock. I hope I've been some help to you. And I hope I didn't scare you too much with the caution part. But you do have to be very careful and cautious on handling this clock. Because it can cost you a lot of money for replacement parts. I have some other models here that I've been working on recently. I'll show you some of them. There's three or four of them here. Might be a little interest to you. This is a model 528-1, which is very similar to the 528 with the square dial on. Also a nice clock. Remember the piece was given was given to a gentleman for his user service with a company, which was quite common with some of the larger companies. This is still another. <clears throat> it's still a 528 without the dash one. Which they had made. And this one's a very early one. This is called a Model 2. It was built somewhere between 1940 and 1948. It has a little different feature on the on the adjustments. I'll show you that. The adjustment on the top for this one has a knob to control it with. You turn the knob to go fast or slow as opposed to the one on the 528. The adjustment on the 528 has a regulator on the top. Quite unique. Now this model too, if you ever see one, <clears throat> LaCocha was trying to save some money in producing these clocks in the early days of the 30s and 40s to try to keep the cost down. And what they done, they took the bellow and they soldered it fast inside the drum. So when the bellow goes bad, you'll have to replace it. Either have to replace the whole drum with the bellow, which is very expensive, or you can unsolder the bellow out and then refurbish the drum to accommodate the new bellow, which is what I do with this one here. They tell me the drums are somewhere around $150 to $200 today, and to buy a, another bellow for $250, you're looking at almost $400 just to replace the, the, the motor in the back. So if you see one that has a soldered bellow, and don't get scared that it, somebody had done it. This was done at the factory. It's on a Model 2. Now until we meet again, may your clock keep on ticking forever. <laughs>